Please welcome Jamila Bay. Just a second, because even though I don't have a PowerPoint, I like podiums. <laughs> I want to thank you, Unify, and everyone who worked so hard to put this conference together, and uh, everybody who came out to hear me yak at you this evening. I'm delighted to be in Iowa. It's awesome here, and it's not too cold. Thank you very much. Did the mic just go out? Yes, the mic just went out. Um, yeah, the broadcast training is a good thing when that happens. Uh. <laughs> we did time trials, they didn't help apparently. <laughs> Ah, just imagine if we didn't practice that. Yay. <laughs> okay, yay. So let me uh, get get this comfy again. Um, as I think I was explaining, I'm Jamila. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for the nice weather. Um, I got this big, huge thing on my hand. Yeah, I'm going to explain that really fast. Um, I have the world's cutest toddler, and he's really glad he's cute because when he slammed mommy's door in a hand and broke my finger, um, it would have been awesome. If you friend me on Facebook, you can see pictures. It's all gnarly and stitched. It's um, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a little, I'm, I'm still not used to not having my hand, and I'm a hand hopper, so please don't forgive the big old bandage. Disclaimer, sorry. It's going to be here the whole talk. <laughs> <sighs> so, uh, happy Black History Month. Next month, happy Women's History Month. Uh, happy all of the months of all of the people that we are. And I want to talk about all of us at one point or another this evening. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about me. I, I am indeed Jamila Bay. I come from the wonderful town of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And... Uh, I now live in Washington, D.C., where I have for the past dozen years, and I have always found that I didn't exist. It's sad, but it's true. Um, everywhere I went, I've always been told, oh, we didn't know that there were girl debaters <laughs> who could whip everybody's bleep. <laughs> We didn't know that there were black people in the Billy Joel fan club. <laughs> so we're living here in Allentown. Uh, back to disclaimer, part two. So I also learned that I am sensitive to many painkillers and um, the, the husky voice here and the off-key, I usually hit Allentown much better than I just did, um, is, is a reaction to the fact that I just can't take certain things. So um, I will be drinking a lot of water, and it's all the fault, kid's fault, but he's so cute. All I can do is go, I'll be angry at you. <laughs> um, I think the disclaimers are over now. Um, but... Uh, you know, I, I, I always just, I, I am a loud person, I'm an obnoxious person, and I don't mind being different. I realize that causes me to stand out, and I realize that I'm unique in that perspective. So I have to be very sensitive when talking about how people who may not see themselves represented <laughs> or who may not be comfortable going, damn it, I don't see myself represented, fix it, uh, may be thinking and feeling, particularly in this movement. Now, those of us who are wearing very cool t-shirts from last year, uh, I'm looking at you, lovely lady, who's on the front of that shirt? Charles Darwin, whoa! 
Darwin was known for a couple of theories, you know, survival of the fittest, natural selection. Those are theories that work on the premise of diversity. Is that fair to say we're my biology people? Isn't it fair to say that diversity helps a species to become more robust and uh, protect itself against predators and groups that don't want them to form on campuses and all that kind of thing? <laughs> so, our celebration of Darwin Day and Darwin Week and ourselves as beings who came about from earlier beings is that me doing that? Okay. Okay, wait. Uh, no, I don't. Uh, forgive me. Okay, here. We're, here's what we're going to do. We're going to turn it like this. I do have a pretty big mouth most of the time. Okay, yeah. I think this, yeah, okay, this still works. Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, diversity is indeed an advantage for most things, including people. So I titled my talk, The Future Belongs to Us, Facts Diminish Faith. Now what, what does that mean, Facts Diminish Faith? Well, as we learn more, as more people have access to information, as more people see lovely Darwin t-shirts and, and hear about this skeptic movement, more people are inclined to say, huh, I never thought that I could do that. I never thought that I could think that way. I never knew that there was an option. And when we make it safer for those people who want to come into this movement, who want to learn more, who want to do good science, we all prosper and we all benefit. Um, more and more people are learning about those options and those alternatives to the world and the fat and, and, and against the backdrop of faith and whatnot. Um, small digression, but not really. I come from a news background, and the news I have to talk about this past week because there have been so many things that I think we can take a lesson from and, and learn from and look at. So uh, New York Magazine had, a, had an illustration of President Barack Obama, well, it wound up being President Barack Obama, but that March of Progress illustration that shows the ape, uh, and then eventually a man with a, or a, a being with a spear, and then what we look like today as modern men. Well, those of us who like science illustration recognize that that's a famous one, and it's, it is what it is. Um, but there's been a huge flap because it was depicted as, it was using President Obama. He was the last man, and then it showed him carrying the rainbow pride flag showing his evolution to a position of acceptance of gay marriage. And uh, the blogosphere, the, the journalism world, and a lot of other places have lit up going, you know, how dare they? You can't depict the president as a monkey, technically. It's an ape, I know. We know. Um, <laughs> apes don't have tails. We know. Um, but, but the story that's told is it's, it's showing the president as a monkey and then he's got this gay pride flag and how dare you do such a depiction. A lot of people were upset about that. A lot of people had reason to be upset about that. Um, skeptics should say something. Moving along, we'll be right back. Uh, Roland Martin. Uh, Anybody on the Twitter see anything about that guy? Roland Martin is a CNN commentator, and he's a lot of places, uh, African-American reporter. And he tweeted the night of the Super Bowl that my beloved Steelers were not in. <laughs> <laughs> that last play, when the Steelers were playing against Tebow. That was an illegal formation. That, that should have been called that. <laughs> We'll get over it. We'll get over it. We've got six rings. We'll get another. Anyhow, <laughs> Roland Martin, the night of the Super Bowl this year, tweeted, if there's a guy at your Super Bowl party smack the ish out, who's hyped about the, the Beckham ad, the underwear ad with David Beckham looking all underwear-y, um, <laughs> if there's a guy at your Super Bowl party who's excited about that, smack the ish out of him, ish meaning S-H blank T, 
I, I, yeah, broadcast training. If there's a microphone, I can't swear, and I'm so profane usually. It's weird. <laughs> um, a number of gay rights groups and a number of human rights groups came down instantly on Roland Martin and said, you are advocating for violence against homosexuals. And Roland, who is a powerful and opinionated person, went back on the Twitter and was like, no, I am talking about you don't have soccer ads during football season, that's foolishness. I hate soccer. And, you know, and Glad uh, and, a, and a number of the other uh, groups were saying, you didn't say anything about soccer. You said if there's a guy excited about watching a man in an underwear ad, he needs to be smacked. Um, he also, Roland Martin also tweeted uh, that there was a player who was wearing a, a, a pink suit, and he said uh, there, that that was, Roland tweeted again the night of the Super Bowl, uh, who was that in that pink suit? Uh, and, and the hashtag was team whoop that donkey, but not donkey, the three-letter word. So again, you know, people said, no, Roland, you're not talking about soccer. That's not what you meant, and we know it. So just from what I understand this morning, uh, Roland met with the nation's big gay rights group to have a conversation with them. Moving along, but we will be back. Fox commentator Liz Trotta, she asked when talking about the issue of sexual assault and rape, to, and rape in the military, well, what did they expect? They're in those close quarters. Women are there. And uh, there's a there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of flack over that. There, there's a lot of backlash, and Fox News, who is no stranger to controversy, is dealing with a number of people who are profoundly upset that one of their people would be on the air and say such a thing. Now, what does this mean? It means I'm a news junkie. It means I follow all this stuff because I like to. But this is a moment in our culture that's very similar to the moment that I see in this movement. When there are people who have one point of view, when there are people who don't have much diversity of thought, of experience, of idea, a lot of times messages don't really translate well. Messages don't travel. And there can be a lot of hurt feelings sometimes. There need to be, because we know that people, when their feelings get hurt, like to get up and do something about it, which, which can be a, a road toward progress. When we look at, at Roland, uh, I'm sorry, when we look at the, the New York Magazine March of Prog Progress thing, uh, a, a number of groups spoke out about that. Now, those of us who like science illustration looked at that and recognized it, and many of us might even argue, that's not racist. It has nothing to do with the president being a monkey. I don't see any monkeys. Those are apes. And uh, the end of it is President Obama supporting gay marriage. He himself used the word evolved when talking about his position and how it changed through the years. However, if you, that was me, if you are an African American, if you are a person of origin where the term macaca is hurled at you as an epithet, when you see, even though you may understand what that illustration is, when you see a person who may resemble you, or even doesn't have to resemble you, but you understand the context that says when you illustrate an African American, the most powerful African American in the world, as a simian, that's racist talk. That's race baiting. There are a lot of conversations being had one way or the other, but New York Magazine came out and said, you know, we, we could have been more sensitive. We should have had the ability to get some more input, they wound up taking that illustration down off of their website and conversations continue, but they showed that they were willing to be sensitive to those people who looked at that and saw it a completely different way. Roland Martin met this morning with uh, the gay rights groups 
Um, you know, and he, he wrote a really heartfelt apology after the flap and said, you know, I was a victim of bullying as a kid. I would not advocate for anybody smacking somebody because of their sexual preference. That's not what I'm talking about. You know, I hate soccer. I sent off a tweet talking about, you know, how dare you put up David Beckham during the best football game every year, even though the Steelers weren't in. That's me. Roland Martin didn't say that about the Steelers. Again, the need to understand the point of view from someone who is not you is paramount when it comes to considering very important issues that for a lot of people are far touchier than we might want to admit. Uh, Liz Trotta, well I would argue with this one. I don't believe it's a mere difference of opinion. I don't, I personally don't understand how her comment could be taken in any other way than to say women shouldn't be in combat because you know men can't men can't hold down their passions. They see a woman and they've just got to have sex with her. Um, though we all know, I mean, really. Really. Um, but again, it's not about a difference of opinion. It's about experience and understanding that other people who see the world differently from you have something to add. Is this a bit of a wax on, wax off moment yet? Do I really need to draw out the actual parallel that there are a number of issues in this movement uh, in which people involved feel that women don't have an appropriate voice, women don't have a fair place at the table. Uh, African Americans and other people of, of minority origin don't have a place at the table, they're not well represented. Uh, people of, of differing sexual backgrounds. But we can all learn and grow. We know diversity is a good thing. How do we go about benefiting from that ourselves? Well, the future needs more people to be skeptical, and we are the answer. We are indeed the answer. Many of the ills of this nation that we see right now can be fixed with a little bit of science. May take some time, may take some work, but the potential is there and the possibility is our own. Um, one of the things that the right does very right is this. As a journalist who needs to find experts somewhere, I always know how to find Whoever is whoever has anything to do with that issue, case in point, it's not an if, it's a when. Police brutality happens, a young man of color who may not have even been doing anything at the time winds up dead. Or there's, there's, there's violence that happens and young men of color uh, wind up dead. Who's the first person that that news crew is going to go? After the family, who's the first person that news crew is going to go and talk to? I'll give you a hint. People, we can't have no more of this. Let's pray that the scourge of violence leaves our community. Or a smaller town pastor. You know, they make themselves know themselves. I do speak English. Um, they make themselves know, they make themselves findable. Might skeptics have anything to say about, I don't know, the rate of eye, the, the successful rate of eyewitness identifications? Do we talk about those things? I think we do. I think we should do more of it. I think we should make ourselves more known because we see in, in that kind of instance how people who people who have a particular worldview are the ones that are always gone to. And we have something to say that can challenge that. We have, we believe in evidence. We can show empirical evidence about, well, the rates of identification by an eyewitness is successful here, 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 or whatnot. But we're not doing that. And I argue that we need to be. I am a woman. I like women. Some of my best friends are women. 
If you are a woman and you ever require any kind of reproductive care, might you want somebody to speak up when the only option you have is in a town where there's a medically affiliated hospital? In the state of Virginia right now, that personhood amendment thing is looking like it actually might pass. Even Mississippi said no. A fertilized egg is a person. How does that, what does that do for me then if, if I have a fertilized egg in me and I choose to ride a bike and I fall off my bike? Then I'm not pregnant anymore. Should I be locked up? Might skeptics who understand the way the body works have something to say about this? In Arizona, if you're a woman and you're in a Catholic hospital and you're carrying a baby that does, or if you're carrying a pregnancy or whatever term you want to use, and that pregnancy is not viable and it's causing you actual health problem, you could go into sepsis and die. If you go to a Catholic hospital, what's, what's the rule there? Let her die. Is that good science? Is that justice? That's the law in a lot of places. There are a lot of children who need, who need homes, who languish in foster care. I beat up on Virginia because I can throw a stone and hit it from my house. Literally, I can. Um, as it stands right now, they're, they're, arguing, uh, they're arguing a bill that will make it so that uh, any kind of organization that deals with adoption or foster care can have a morality clause. So if you don't think it's moral that a white mommy raise a black baby, if you don't think it's moral that two homosexuals who love each other and really want to make a child life better, they, they, it ain't moral. They should be able to raise a child and love him and you know feed him every night, pat him on the head, bandage his little knee and buy him a bike. Oh, that's, that's immoral, lot, according to some of these places. Now, the thoughts that we have, the evidence that we can bring, the researchers that we are, and frankly, the skeptical nature that makes many of us just say, hmm, why? is what I argue this country needs right now. I argue is what groups like this need right now. So we know that we have what other folks want and what other folks need, including ourselves. Excuse me. But a lot of us are, are afraid of coming out with good reason when we're not religious anymore or, you know, contemplating it, uh, we tend to have situations where those of us who have families, uh, some of our families don't like us anymore. Some of us get called into courtrooms and the judge is told, well, Your Honor, he won't provide for the spiritual fitness of our children. And we have evidence that judges consider that when granting custody. Is that right? Is that fair? No. Here's how groups like this need to be addressing these things to our benefit, including the group itself. Well, community, we're humans, we like each other. Community's essential. It's important that we get together. It's, okay, there we go. It's important that we get together and make a community that makes people interested in staying in it and working in it and being a part of it and making it more interesting for other people to come in and give it some diversity of opinion and thought and gender balance and all other kinds of things as well. One of the things I argue, and this room is a wonderful representation because frankly, uh, there are a lot of women in here. Woo, -hoo, give yourselves a hand because it rock, you know, you rock. Love you too, men. Love you too. Um, <laughs> The skeptic movement has been, dare I use the term, plagued um, with perceptions that there aren't enough women, there aren't enough women in positions of leadership and positions of power. Uh, guys don't get it. Um, and I think, that, I think that there is some 
validity to that because anytime somebody feels that, usually they have a reason to. And one of the things that we need to do and we need to recognize is that when we have women who are able to take part in our organizations and feel welcomed into our organizations, they tend to attract more women. Why is that a good thing? Attracting more women tends to attract more women, tends to attract younger people because women have kids and like to bring their babies along. Churches do this really well, you may have noticed. <laughs> Whenever you offer child care, women tend to bring their children. And then women tend to say, well, I'm going to bring the person I'm partnered with too. And we can grow from that. We can have more people who will come in and stay in. One of the things that I'm just overjoyed about, especially because my kid is aging as we speak, as we all are, you know, um, <laughs> You know, uh, the whole idea that, that Camp Quest is expanding and making it so that very young people, instead of having to sing that Father Abraham and Many Sons song that, like, every time I have a nightmare about camp as a child, is, like, playing in the background. I never liked that song, but they sing it so much. You know, being able to bring younger people to a position where we can think about encouraging them to form community and to be critical and skeptical and sing some imagine while they're at it and have s'mores, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Reaching out doesn't even, I argue, have to be a major labor. We're people. Most of us eat at least a couple times a day. Food is always a good thing. One of the things, again, we, can, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, okay, we're my Louis Jordan fans. Saturday night, fill in the blank. Stopping at the Saturday night. Oh, come on, nobody listens to them. Okay, well, I'm, okay, fine. Saturday night, fish fry. Uh, there we go. Okay. All right, here's, here's an easy one. This is, this is the trivia portion of you. Know it, scream it out. The day before Ash Wednesday... In New Orleans is a big freaking deal. Mardi Gras! Mardi Gras. Yay. Yay! Yay! I have yet to be invited to a skeptic Mardi Gras party. Can't we throw some beads and, you know, it's, it's not just about, it's just, you know, there are celebrations that bring people together. The thing that keeps many folks tied into a religious tradition is not so much that they believe the literal word of what they're being taught. See women who go to Catholic churches who happily use birth control. But you know, it's in a sense of community. There's ritual there. There's great food. And if you've ever been to a black church, really awesome music a lot of times and super hats. Hats are just, <laughs> I mean, really. It's a cultural thing. When you, when you, I, I think, I, I'm married to a person who is, who is ethnically Jewish. Um, little trivia that, you know, if, if ever it comes up. Um, I, I think he believes in God, it just never comes up with us, so I really don't know. But, like, he's ethnically Jewish. Um, when we were just dating, I told him, uh, dude, Steelers is my religion, you got to convert. <laughs> and now we have a little Steelers baby. But you know what? Super Bowls, some, some families celebrate, celebrate Easter and Christmas and whatever. We do Super Bowl Sunday. That is, that's our thing. Everybody comes together. We already have the ritual in place. What does everybody eat on Super Bowl Sunday? Nachos, burgers, it doesn't matter. You just get together. And then if you are a Pittsburgher or you don't have to be, come on, brothers and sisters, love the Pittsburgh Steelers, wave. What do we all wave? We wave our terrible towels. We have rituals in other ways. We have ceremonies in other ways. And I, I know the choir is here with me. I mean, you're all in this room listening to me. Clearly, you sort of get that, uh, that coming together and talking about a common issue or having you know, common ideals is a good thing. Don't reinvent the wheel. Borrow. Do some, do some fun stuff on other holidays. Perhaps. What would a skeptic Cinco de Mayo look like? Well, you know, a 
Could be, I don't know, I'm just throwing it out there. <laughs> you guys have the like university budget and stuff, you know. But what would a sicko tomorrow for skeptics look like? Huh, maybe having people who are of Mexican descent who might think in long, think along the lines of what groups do might enjoy having a, one of their traditional celebrations celebrated where people are saying, hey, we, we like you, we want to come to know you, we, we like Cinco de Mayo too. Might that encourage some people to get involved in a group, to come out, to meet folks? Maybe. It's Black History Month. Now, I, you may not have noticed, I am black. <laughs> um, and I have been black my whole life. <laughs> and so, uh, when it's Black History Month, I'm, I get to be who I am all the time or whatever. But, one of the things that, uh, that I really was happy to see is that there are, there are a bunch of groups that are going to celebrate the Black Day of Solidarity. And what that is, is on the 26th of this month, um, any group that wants to can just sort of say, hey, we understand that there are black folks who have been skeptics and atheists, uh, and they happen to have made a difference in history. Who's Butterfly McQueen? Thank you, thank you. She was an actress in Gone with the Wind. She was the first African American ever to win an Oscar. The quote she's famous for is, as my ancestors are free from slavery, I am free from the slavery of religion. Did you know that? Frederick Douglass, easy one. Prayed for 20 years, nothing happened until he prayed with his feet. That doesn't sound real like, you know, there's one answer and he is Jesus to me. Having that type of event, those types of events, you know, it allows a lot of people to go, oh, huh, well, yeah, maybe, maybe I will show up and spend some time and, you know, come out to a day of solidarity. Um, one of the groups that I, uh, I spend a lot of time with is a secular family group. I have a kid, his middle name is Hitchens. Yeah. <laughs> He's three and a half. I planned it. Um, I have a kid, he's really cute, he broke mommy's hand, whatever. Um, and there's a skeptical families group that, that has a happy birthday Charles Darwin party every year. We had a cake with uh, with the tortoise on it one year. One of the kids grabbed the tortoise's tail, his shell, but we still had the cake, it was great. <laughs> when, when those young people little tiny young people grow up to be bigger young people and starting their own families might be I would argue it might be harder to convince them to you know give up their love of Charles Darwin and think that he is the devil who's trying to teach them that the, you know you can't be a Darwinist the world is only 6,000 years old the kid who has a celebration every year for Charles Darwin's birthday might take umbrage at that <laughs> kid who's been celebrating Charles Darwin's birthday the same way other kids celebrate other birthdays might join a group like this when they get a bit bigger, you think? Um, having, having, uh, being who you are and, and some of us also feel that we are identified as skeptics and atheists and humanists and brights and rationalists and nature lovers and science geeks, um, go science geeks, I'm one of those two. Uh, we understand that the only way change happens is that we've got to keep moving forward. We don't have any interest in keeping things status quo the way they are, the way they've been. You know, I'm in America, if anybody watched HBO last night, but you're all studying and stuff, so you probably didn't. But, you know, I'm in a marriage that was illegal in most of this country, you know, and in and, and the lifetime of a few of the people here. 
All those against interracial marriage go, get out of the room. <laughs> Maybe not. Gay marriage, we all see the evolution of that issue right before us right now. I didn't know till today. Go Iowa. Woo! -hoo. <laughs> you know, wow. Who? The state can't tell me who I'm going to give half my stuff to when we break up. <laughs> um, forward progress. Difference. Diversity. These are all things that make us better and make us stronger. Now, there are a lot of people who disagree with that. There are a lot of people who want to, you know, take us back screaming into the time where I wasn't even a human. I was three-fifths the labor of a white dude. I don't want to go back. Depending on where you live, there are a lot of people who want to tell you that if you have sex, you need to be a parent right then. Well, that's what happens when you take birth control away from a woman who's having sex. It's what happens. Some people want to go back to that. I would argue those who like medicine believe that, you know, believe that sex is a choice. Shouldn't be only for procreation. Might have something to say about that. A lot of the traditions that people come from tell them that they are wicked and unworthy and a wretch and dirty depending on what day of the calendar it is for her particular body clock. You know, um, I think a lot of us would argue, no, not necessarily. And we shouldn't be afraid to say, no, not necessarily. Um, I personally sit in a newsroom and have sat in various newsrooms where uh, I personally have been told, oh no, you can't go cover that story because you're an atheist and uh, you, you couldn't bring a, a, a proper moral lens to it. And uh, yeah, I've, I've, I've actually been told that. And, and I said, you know, here's the problem with, with, that, with that way of looking at me. When you send a reporter to a story who is a person who identifies as I am of faith, here's what happens. That person goes out and everybody they talk to, the underlying statement is, let's suppose there's a man in the sky who's looking at everything we do and is making judgments about what some of us do and is right here, right now. And I say, I'm carrying a torch for none of them. None of them. I don't, none. I, I am the blank slate you need to be sending out there because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to question everything that person says. I'm going to say, why? Hmm. Show me proof. Got any, got any studies I can look at on that? Water to wine, huh? Hmm. Where's the peer review study on that? <laughs> oh, he was an ice skater? Oh, oh. Hmm. Was, <laughs> show me. Our little ones, you know, our little ones do that. I argue the closest thing to a prayer that exists is the word why. Why pray tell? Why? Help me understand. Learning is something that keeps us evolving. Learning is something that keeps us moving forward. Learning helps us to get better, be better, do better. And the world needs us now. It's Iowa. It's February. People are outside with no coat on. Why? Science telling us anything about why that might be? We understand. It doesn't mean that we can fix it right now, but... Maybe we have some ideas about that. Making our voices heard is the only way that we can move forward and that we can bring about better circumstances for all of us. I doubt that anybody in here doesn't want life improvements for 
himself, herself, and our fellow man. Evolution is happening, and our thoughts and our behaviors need to evolve as well. We cannot be afraid. It's, it's hard. Some people are going to get kicked out of their house. Wait till you get your own mortgage or at least lease agreement. I understand. That. You know, it, it's there are a lot of there are a lot of ways to do it, but the bottom line is that it needs to be done. I'm glad I'm no more a Neanderthal. Go evolution. Thank you. Jamila here for about 15 more minutes, uh, or half, and we're going to do some Q&A, uh, but just so you everyone knows, we're going to be headed to Bex on the hill after this, so please come and hang out with us, with Jamila, and uh, have a good time, but uh, if anyone would like to ask any questions, please raise your hand, and uh, I'll let Jamila take over. I stand open for cross-examination. The young man in the front, please. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I actually have two comments. One was, I really appreciate your letting us know the views on the Obama evolution poster. Mm -hmm. And I say that because as a biologist, I was ebullient that it was a black man at the end. Because it's usually a white guy that's the epitome of evolution. So I, I, I saw it exactly the other way. Second time, mm -hmm. in my own experience, no matter how sensitively I talk to people as an atheist or a skeptic, no matter how sensitive, we get labeled as shrew. Yeah. So your suggestion, I, I, I'll leave it there. Well, here's, here's the thing. Um, I know exactly of what you speak. And for though, you know, and, and uh, the, the young man explained that, you know, for, simply for, simply for saying, you know, I love puppies. I'm an atheist. We get pilloried and labeled as shrill and all of that. Um, and it's unfair and it's wrong. However, I think it's an issue of authenticity. And I think it's also an issue of just being who you are. It's really hard. Now, uh, let let okay. Let let's go back to um, let's go back in recent U.S. history. There were a whole lot of people who had problems with integration in classrooms because you know kids who sit next to each other in classrooms like talk to each other and then don't hate each other and sometimes end up dating each other and like doing other things with each other. <laughs> A lot of people had a problem with, you know, colored boys sitting next to my Becky Sue. A lot of people still have problems with that. But let's look at what's happened in the past, you know, 50 years of the evolution of just the integration issue. Well, we see that 18% of African American men are married to women who are not identified as African American. About 9% of African American women are married to people who are not identified as African American. And um, what it shows is that the laws changed. You can't ban people from miscegenating or race mixing or marrying who they love. Or even just having a great time and then going home. Um, you can't ban that anymore. Um, Women, you know, demanding that right to cast the ballot. They're all hysterical half the time. And, you know, they just need their husbands to tell them what the will is and how to do it. You know, it's abysmal the number of, the, the small number of women who are in elected political office in this country. You know, particularly when their health is being used as a political football right now. Um, but, the people who are otherized, to invent a word, when they are 
given the opportunity to simply be in a place and be who they are, change happens. It's real hard to hate all black people when you might have grown up around black folks and have friends who are black. It's real hard to hate the homosexuals when your first cousin is one and his boyfriend is the sweetest person who gave you that baseball card you've been looking for your whole life and you actually like the guy. It's real hard to hate, you know. That, oh man, the, the, where is it? Is it Minnesota? The, the ad with the American actress who's of Chinese descent who was, you know, they, uh, stab it out, Deb stab it out. I'm having, I'm not downloading the state she's from. Michigan. Michigan, thank you. I knew Wolverine, that's right, never mind. Okay, so they're, you know, they're, her opponent, uh, her opponent put out this attack ad where a very pretty young girl who is clearly Chinese is riding a bike and comes out and says, Thank you, Dev Spindon. Now, I mean, I can't, it, it, it was like that stereotypical. The funny thing is, the girl didn't even have an accent, but she was speaking in broken English. And as somebody who works, in radio and listens to accents all day, I instantly peg that as an American speaker. Um, and it comes out she is American, but you know, she pretty much said, thank you for, you know, you raise taxes, jobs go to China, we get rich. I mean, it was something that egregious. Oh, Google it, huh? YouTube it, it's there, it's there. And there's been a backlash. His, 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 the, the, the guy whose name I'm not going to say for a reason, um, uh, his, his rating has declined and Deb Stabenow has gone up in the polling right now because people are ticked about that ad. They're saying that's why I vote for him. So when, when someone who's identified as an atheist is out, is visible, is likable, and likable varies depending on, but you know, uh, it's real hard to demonize everybody. I, I, I know for a fact that there are, you know, I'm sure people have heard this, you can't be an atheist, you're so nice. <laughs> Take that left-handed compliment, because it's forcing the person who said that to reevaluate what, well, but I like, oh, brain overload, I'll pray on it. <laughs> so, you know, where, I'm a big fan of wearing our buttons. What's that, Amy? Oh, well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> you know, what's that book you're reading? Who's Richard Dawkins? Who's Christopher Hitchens? Let me show you something on YouTube. <laughs> you know. So, um, yeah, we, there are people who are always going to hate me because I'm black. There are people who are always going to hate you because you're a privileged white man and you don't know anything about what hardship could be. There are people who are going to hate you because you're an atheist and you say, yeah, I do. screw that, I'm sleeping in on Sunday. <laughs> or I'm going to use electricity on Friday night. <laughs> you know, my cell phone's going off and I want to date. You know. So um, we have to affect that which we can affect. And, you know, it is sad. We, I mean... Rapists are more popular than atheists in this country. I understand what that means. I get it. I get it. We all do, I would argue. I can't speak for us all, but I think we do. But that doesn't mean that we retreat. Some studies are saying that 30% under 30 claim no religious affiliation. Now, does that mean that they're all like reading the God delusion and getting the Adam tattoos on their necks? Maybe not. <laughs> but it does mean that my kid or my grandkid might go into a courtroom one day and uh, the line that worked that got my cousin, my first cousin, who looks more like me than any of my siblings, got his kid, uh, they got his kid estranged from him for a while. Um, when, when a spouse says, Your Honor, I need to read you a list of books on my ex's bookshelf that my child has access to. The God delusion. God is not great. The God virus. That maybe that judge will say so. Or whatever. That ain't a reason to deny somebody access to his child. 
So we just got to keep being who we are and just, you know, work in what we can work. Okay. I want to make sure I get a bunch of questions, so um, if, if I may, uh, there was somebody over here, and then I'm going to come up here, and then I'm going to go back to you, and I'll just sort of do three at one, if that's that agreeable. Okay, so I saw somebody over here. Uh, okay, well, you in the front, in the cool shirt. Oh, okay. Um, I was wondering what you think of, like, how um, skeptics and atheists, like, as a journalist, and, and like, atheists running for public office, how do you think they can gain support from the general public as, like, you know, people who are not intimidating, people who have opinions, who can represent them and serve them at the same time? Yeah. Do you get where I'm going? <laughs> I do. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Sorry. Yep. Okay, so you mentioned um, that, that you know we can all benefit uh, in the in the secular movement from uh, from different perspectives, and I wonder uh, what I, I'd like your take on this uh, this postmodernist critique of the movement that um, that we're too dependent on uh, Western thought and uh, and Western philosophy that we're too Western centered. love smart people because y'all ask some great questions. <laughs> okay, I'm going to start with the young lady in the first. Now, I need to take my jacket off. This. <laughs> Can't take this fake love off. I am a political reporter and I have been a political junkie my whole life. And um, I'm deeply embarrassed that I cannot call to mind. There's an organization, it's nonpartisan, and I covered their event like a month ago, but the whole point is 2012, there's a lot of redistricting going on in the US. Bear with me, I gotta get this background out. You'll see where I'm going in a minute. There's a lot of redistricting going on. Uh, there are a lot of really, really hot issues uh, dealing with women, of course. And because of that, these groups are calling for more women to run. When women run, they get elected at the same rate that men who are running get elected. At. They raise money at similar rates, and really there's not that much difference at all. There's also a philosophy uh, amongst uh, political agents and whatnot that women get in office to do something, men get in office to be someone. And women also, and, and this is borne out in the U.S., this is borne out in a lot of other places. You know the Sudan has more women in public office than the U.S.? Mo Africa is women are but. Women are but on that issue. And India. And India, yes, Prime Minister. Prime you know, Minister, yeah. yeah. So I mean, you know, we, hey, go. I mean, the last three Secretaries of State in the U.S. have been women. Woohoo! Um, one thing women also do very well is they reach across the aisle, uh, and and they work together. You know, women are far less women are far less likely to just you know be like, I'm gonna filibuster you. You know, they're like, I got a kid to get home to and, uh, and a soccer game, so let's work this out, okay? So, not that men don't do that, um, that was a little bit of a joke. Now, why am I bringing up all this women stuff? Well, women weren't always given access to politics, even in this country. And when they're given access and when they can run, they tend to do well. Women are issue driven more so than men. Research has borne that out. If you want to send me an email, I can put you in touch with the folks who are doing such research. Uh, Rutgers University Center of Women in Politics is one place. But anyhow, um, issues are the way. For example, if 
you're somebody who you know wants to get a road built, if you're somebody who wants to give more funding to school versus bond issue for a stadium somewhere, if you get involved in an issue such as that, uh, and it comes out, oh yeah, by the way, no, no, I'm not going to be doing a prayer, I'm not, I'm not a religious person, I'm an atheist, or whatever, however it works for you. Um, a lot of times people are more willing to say, well, you know, she's against that bond issue too, or he's against that, you know, he's against this thing. Um, we live in America. There is, there, I mean, it, despite what our, our document says, there shall be no, no religious text, we know that that ain't happening. We know that's not happening. People who are voting need to write letters to the editor, need to say, hey, why did you, you know, why are you listing these candidates' uh, religious affiliation and, and, you know, and your write-up of them? Our document says there should be no test. If you put it on there, it makes people feel like they've got to answer. What's your problem? See, I can't do that. I can't do that. But more of us need to. And how we can find, you know, we need to get out there, we need to run. Some of us will be sacrificial lambs and not make it. That's fine. Some of us are going to be sacrificial lambs anyway. Some of us are not going to have a snowball's chance. Some of us are going to get in and go, wow, should have did that years ago. Pete Stark can't be the only one. We know he's not. We know he's not. Um, but there are, the culture is such that it's okay to ask the question. And uh, we need to have more people willing to say, hey, either you love this country and want to support its constitution or you don't. And if you want to support its constitution, we need to be in line with these things. So it, it's going to take a while. Uh, Eddie Tabish of the American Atheist, who's their national legal director, I believe is his title, uh, he gave a wonderful <coughs> talk uh, last year in uh, Des Moines uh, about looking at a hundred year plan. His theory is that atheists need to become single issue voters and we need to be able to say, I don't care what else my issue is, where are you on separation of church and state? And we need to support those candidates. That's what his theory is. Um, as, as, uh, as somebody who uh, looks at this or whatever, um, there are a lot of people who just, you know, who are going to vote for whoever they feel like respects them and addresses their causes. And uh, if you're on the side of the issue they like, for example, women having access to health care, they might go, oh, well, you know, yeah, they're godless, but... I need my pills every month. <coughs> they may be godless, but I'm not going to die because I only have a Catholic hospital I could get to. What? What? Get out there and run. Get out there and be visible. It's hard to hate people who you see every day and then realize you like it and then they come out and you're like, real? I didn't know. Uh, me too. So, run. No. A uh, postmodern Western critique of the ethnocentricity of atheism. <laughs> I do speak academic a little. Um, I have the world's biggest girl crush on Jennifer Michael Hecht. She is the author of a fantastic book called Doubt, a history of skepticism. Or I think it's a history of skepticism, but doubt. Jennifer Michael Hecht. She lays out the fact that we have been the majority throughout our time evolving on this planet. Uh, she talks about uh, the Indian tradition uh, of. Darn. I'm in the middle. I'm reading three of her books right now and I'm going, wait a minute. No, that's from the other book. Um, but she, she explains how. Uh, there was a critique of the Hindus, you know, 4,000 years ago. If you believe that burning your parents when they're dead will send them to God, why wait? Burn them now. Wouldn't that be a good thing? Uh, if, if the soul can exist without a body, then there should be mangoes hanging from the sky with no trees. 
right? Um, I, I love, um, oh, I'm not going to editorialize this one. In the book, uh, in, in Alex Haley's Roots, there's a, there's a passage in which the Africans being stolen over here are in a hold under, under the ship, and they figured out that various people speak different languages and they can pass messages back and forth by moving who's next to who. And uh, somebody screams out, you know, uh, they're, they're, they're scre somebody screams out, you know, well, it is the will of Allah. And somebody else, you know, it's translated, yes, 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 yes. And then somebody else screams out, well, if this is Allah, then give me the devil. Everybody, everybody on the face of this pale blue dot when faced with the choice of, well, the gods, God, that God, this God, me God, um, when faced with the choice of this is the way it is, there have, already, there have always been people who said, prove it. That's the legacy we have. That's the legacy we carry. Um, Jennifer Michael Heck is the academic who uh, wrote that up, but she's not the only one doing that kind of work. Um, the idea that uh, atheism is, you know, Western white man's idea is far too prevalent, far too prevalent. Um, and I argue that it, it, it will, I mean, let's be real, the four horsemen, they all kind of look alike. I mean, Sam Harris, he's really awesome and all, but he's the young one, and he's not all that young. You know, um, but that is starting to change, and it's starting to change because of groups like this, because of people who come to groups like this, because of people who write and blog and YouTube video and rap and sing and do whatever it is that we humans like to do to express ourselves, you know, make t-shirts and wear them. Um, I, I, I'm a little young for the whole let my freak flag fly thing, but, uh, you know, let our heathen flags fly. Wear your shirts, wear your buttons. You know, uh, don't be afraid to be like, really, Denzel Washington, you said that he's an atheist on the freaking Today Show, and that's why he is a sociopath. Really? I know. So now I can't like Denzel anymore. Oh, well. But you know what, when uh, uh, we can see what we're able to do when somebody says, no gelato for you, we react. We go on Reddit, we go on Facebook, we go on YouTube, we react. In our hands we hold technology unknown 15 years ago. Streaming the Super Bowl like this, who thought that two years ago? Well, we thought, it, but we were like, I ain't paying them rates. Um, <laughs> maybe I. Um, we progress, we move forward. We need to know the history from where we come. And there have always been people who have been kissed by the sun, who don't need higher level sunblock, though we do need sunblock. You know, 15 works for me. Um, <laughs> who have been questioners, who have been skeptics, who have been atheists, who have been heathens. We've always been around. And uh, that type of language comes from people who don't see themselves represented in the modern day. Nobody's complaining that A. Philip Randolph, like, you know, there are nobody, nobody's complaining about them, nobody knows about them. Major, major figure in labor in this country. Black guy. He arguably is the reason for the modern black middle class. Uh, I'm sure y'all can get to Chicago and uh, see some of, some of the literal history there. But uh, it, it needs more people who, who can talk about the history. It needs more people who can evidence the history. And, you know, we just we need to keep working forward. Um, it's a critique. It's a criticism. Some people feel it. Some people are always going to just say that because black folks can't be atheists, I keep getting told. I'm like, oh, well, got the memo too late, sorry. You know, you know, oh, yours are a people with a proud tradition and heritage of your felt in the group. 
faith tradition. You can yeah, there were people going when they were making up the laws, really? I can't he oh he can't sit there too? Huh? I'm having a seat. You know. So um, it, it requires work, it requires forward motion and it requires visibility. I stand open. Any other smart people want to ask questions? I had a question for you. Um, we're talking about uh, we're talking a little bit about the Catholic Church and uh, their stand on uh, birth control and stuff. And I was wondering where where do you think the employer's right to choose a health care coverage that covers an abortion patient when they don't want to? Where is where is their first amendment right? So we're asking me to make a personal opinion here. Okay. I'll, I'll put it to you this way. I'm a woman and my reproductive care is essential to my overall health. When you tell me that a drug that you will cover for Susie, my coworker, because she has polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is uh, which is cysts that grow uh, around the ovaries and can cause weight gain and bleeding and headaches and a host of things. Um, well, how do you treat that? You treat it by putting Susie, my coworker, on birth control pills to help her regulate her hormones so that those ill effects and her fertility uh, remain healthy. And then you say, well, Jamila, you can't have that drug. I argue that deputizes the employer to violate my medical privacy by getting in between me and my doctor to ask, well, what you using the drug for? Let's say I have a medical condition that makes pregnancy uh, impossible, that it will kill me, that it will kill me. Should my employer then say, well, our leader who hasn't lived with a woman since his mommy can tell you that you have sex, you get pregnant, you should die. Because you work here, you should die. Well, we're asking my personal opinion, so and, and I want to be clear, this is my personal opinion. Uh, as a woman who has been pregnant, has born a child, who had the choice, because my kid was indeed a choice. We worked really hard on it. <laughs> Not because it wasn't fun, but... Um, <laughs> you know, uh, I have exceptional. I've always had really great insurance. I've always had a husband that I really like. I've never been in a position where I was impregnated against my will. Um, so because of where I work, I might have to shell out hundreds of dollars a month for something that's pennies for somebody who works next door, across the street, whatever. If you are going to tell me that because I choose to work for a religious organization or somebody who's affiliated with a religious organization or somebody who, who holds a personal value system that's in conflict with me taking birth control pills, I say that's, that's not an issue that employers should be free to to tell me they're making for the reason that it's not their medical concern. What if I'm on a drug that will what if I'm on a drug that will deform any child that that, that I conceive? I should just never have sex. Ever. Women have sex. We do it all the time. The, the penalty for sex in some, in some circles it's argued the penalty for sex should be having a child or the, the effect of that and if you're not happy to have sex like an animal who goes in the heat and has sex only to get pregnant and bear live young then you're doing it wrong that's not what our evolution tends to say
not what our evolution tends to say. And uh, as a woman who has never been... Trivia time. Those of you who ate dinner with me cannot answer this, okay? I know the shirt you're wearing. What's the number one cause of death for pregnant women in the U.S.? Throw it out. Childbirth. Okay, childbirth. Childbirth. Bueller. Anybody else want to come up? Childbirth. Homicide, suicide. Women who are pregnant are more likely to be to come to their end at their own hand or the hand of somebody else. They're, check my facts. Get on Google. I know you know how to do it. That's what. That's from the Department of Justice, the U.S. Department of Justice numbers that have been crunched. That's what's killing women who are pregnant. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means we got to look into some social issues. You know, why are women who are pregnant getting murdered? Who are they? Who are they associating with? Doesn't that mean that there needs to be some social interest in making sure that you know these babies aren't just you know these sacred fetuses who come out of the woman and then like need medical care and shelter and you know some of them will need social services. You know, should be able to get them. Um, I understand that people feel strongly about no birth control, no birth control, but, you know, um, there are, uh, let not the American Council of Catholic Bishops get involved in my own medicine before they clean up their own dirty house. Of all the things they've got to concern themselves with, me taking birth control is is what they're dealing with. Um, I I I just I, I, it, it it's 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 maddening. It's maddening because it is what it is. But you know, okay, cross. But well, I think you're inaccurately mis misrepresenting uh, the issue here. It's not like women are not able to have access to birth control because you can go to Planned Parenthood, which is government subsidized, and they will give you free birth control. So I think you're absolutely wrong, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> I happen to live in Washington, D.C. I happen to have access to transportation. I happen to have access to wonderful child care. You presuppose that any woman who wants birth control can do as I can. I can literally trot over and get whatever I want wherever. What if I'm a woman who is living in Mississippi where the only provider is hours away and I have child care? What if I'm a woman who is on a reservation where there is no Planned Parenthood until uh, uh, you know, a day's journey away by car. What if I don't have the financial wherewithal to pay six, $60 a month for a drug that, uh, if, you know, that my crappy insurance might knock down to $5 a month? I argue that you completely miss the issue that I'm not arguing for me, I'm arguing for those who do not have and those who cannot access the care. When you run your abortion <laughs> providers out of everywhere, you have to understand that they're not abortion doctors, they're called doctors. There are times when a woman should no longer be pregnant even though she was because it may kill her, and then who is left to care for her children who are there. There are social aspects to this that nobody's talking about. Yes, I could, hey, if I, if I want to go and fly to Paris right now and get, and get an experimental form of birth control that they're working on over there and I only need to take it once every six months, then you're, nobody's stopping me. There's no law against that. Do I actually have the access? Do I actually have the wherewithal? Um, when you're telling me that a poor woman who's working in a Catholic daycare or in a, in a organization that's affiliated, better scenario. I'm a nurse. No, I'm a nurse's aide. I work in a hospital. The Catholic institution has just bought over that hospital, and all of a sudden, the pills that I use, maybe even for polycystic ovarian syndrome, are now no longer covered. I make eight dollars an hour. I have a kid that I'm raising, and all of a sudden, I have to now pay sixty-five, a hundred dollars a month for birth control pills. Do I have access to them? Yes. Is it a hardship? If I've got to pay full price, perhaps. Um, so if if indeed you say I misrepresent the argument, I argue you're wrong. 